This video was originally recorded at the Force for Good class series at Tibet House, New York in February 2018. To learn more about this ongoing series happening at Tibet House and online, please visit tibethouse.us. So now we begin with the Vimalakirti. You know, I, I usually, beginning of a class here, we usually chant together the Heart Sutra, but we, they forgot to do it, so we won't do it tonight. How many of you know the Heart Sutra by heart? Anybody? <laughs> uh, hello, I know a few of you know it by heart? You want it in, in, in English or what? You know it by heart? Can you recite it then? <laughs> No? It would be good to recite. Anyway, the thing about the Heart Sutra, the key thing about it, so we'll think about it. So the key thing about the Heart Sutra is the emptiness is form, form is emptiness, uh, form is not other than emptiness, emptiness is not other than form. That's the key thing. And form means matter, you know, it doesn't just mean a shape. In a way, I don't like the translation of form. I always like to say emptiness is matter, or voidness is matter. Matter is voidness. Because the key thing about emptiness is it's just the relativity of all the things. It isn't some space in which they are. Space can be an analogy for emptiness, but emptiness is not space. Emptiness is, um, space is also empty, you know. And, uh, and so emptiness means that no thing has intrinsic reality. Everything is empty of an int fixed intrinsic reality, which means everything is relative. And even, and so, and so the absolute is all of the relativity. So emptiness really is the Buddha's discovery of relativity. That's what it is. Long before dear Mr. Einstein. <laughs> so let's reflect on that for a minute before we begin. And then, um, you can chant with me. Let's all chant a little bit, since we don't have the whole text. Just to get in the mood for the class on Vimalakirti, let's start, let's go. Om, so repeat after me, okay? Om, Om. Gate, 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 Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhi, Bodhi. Swaha. Swaha, Om Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhiswaha, Omgate Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhiswaha, Omgate Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhiswaha, Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha Now all together, it's with me, not wait. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Sam Gate Bodhiswaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhiswaha That's great. That means, as you know, I think, does everybody know what that means? It's a man that's the mantra of Prajnaparamita, which means transcendent wisdom. And uh, it is the mantra of, and she is a goddess, actually. She's a great mother of all Buddhas. They call her Saravajina Mata, mother of all victors. And, um, but she also is reality. She's the reality of emptiness slash relativity. And the gate means gone. It's the past, passive participle of, of the verb to go. So gate means gone. So it's like saying gone, gone, very, uh, super gone. Paragate is super gone. Super totally gone. 
enlightenment all hail. That's what it literally means, that mantra. But it's a mantra, so it just evokes the sense of emptiness. And the emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. So if you have an experience where you feel you disappear, it actually is a very important and powerful experience to sort of let go of yourself completely. But then the seeming sort of encounter, losing consciousness, let's say, or being as if everything is nothing or something, of course, is not an encounter with nothing because you can't encounter nothing <laughs> because it isn't there. <laughs> so when you have an experience of seeming unconsciousness, it's something you're projecting also. Just like when you have an experience of the wall, you have an idea of a wall and your brain has a, has a concept for a wall and it organizes the, the, the subatomic and atomic reactions in your optic nerve and your brain and everything into a perception of a wall. So in a way, you're sort of co-creating the wall in your perception. You know, you, with, you think you see the wall and it's self-evidently the wall and it sort of comes over to say, I'm a wall. But actually, we're creating that as a wall. And if you're very drunk or something, you wouldn't know what it was, you know. <laughs> and when your brain is not doing that organizing, you know. And so similarly, when you have an experience of nothing, it's because you have an idea of nothing. And you have an idea of being unconscious. And so you think that's the absolute, that, which is the, that's the, the problem of materialists. They think that that sort of going unconscious is like going to be what death is, and that's what they're going to happen to them when they die. And they're going, to, they're going to rest in nothingness. But that's a total delusion because nothing means there is no nothing. Nothing is not there, so it's not a dark space. And that's not emptiness either. It's just our last sort of ditch, you know, projection actually. The feeling of disappearing into nothing. That's kind of a projection. But that's a little hard to, I mean, you can get it logically maybe, but maybe it's hard to grasp, but it's also very, very powerful. It's an important experience. Tsongkhapa, in one of his books, has a really marvelous thing that I didn't see anywhere else. He says that there's three types of mental habit, perceptual habit. And one is a perceptual habit of something as being absolutely there. And there's a second one is a perceptual habit of not seeing anything there. Having that thing that would seem to be absolutely there, having it disappear. You can perceive, you can have an experience like that, seeing through thing. And the third one is uh, perceiving things without sort of noticing whether they're really there or not there. Sort of unqualified as to existent or non-existent. And then this is very interesting. And then he says, the unenlightened person only has the first and the third of those perceptual habits. And the enlightened person has those same two perceptual habits, but adds the second one to it. So it means that, in, that, that experience of everything being nothing is a very powerful one, but it isn't the true state of affairs. But it's kind of a counter to the experience of everything as being absolutely there. So when you, since we have a habit of thinking that things are intrinsically or absolutely or objectively there, when we really focus deep down on them, we can have a mental experience like we were a cyclotron, you know, like an electron accelerator or something where it disappears. You definitely can have that experience. And, you have a, and some people think that's the experience of emptiness, but it isn't. It's an experience of sort of seeming disappearance, seeming annihilation. Actually, people are frightened of it. People re recoil from that experience. But somehow, the, by having had that experience, one then when one sees the thing again, as if it was really there, but has once had an experience of it disappearing, its real thereness seems illusory. It has a kind of illusory quality, because you know if you press down on it, it will disappear, sort of thing. You follow me? So somehow then, enlightenment is somehow being able to encompass those two opposite things, which seems impossible to us, of course, because we think it's either this or that. You know? But in, enlightenment is a, I call it sometimes the 
ultimate tolerance of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and then, if that seems to you completely impossible, then remember next last time you looked in a mirror. Then when you looked in the mirror, you saw something that had seemed to be really there. There's Bob Thurman in that mirror. Well, his left eye and his right eye have switched places, but otherwise, that's him there. And he's through that window, another guy like me. Like, we have a dog called Miko, and he will bark at himself, his reflection, he never stops. He didn't figure it out. Somehow bumps into the glass and barks and barks. And he's really sweet, you know. The dumber he is, the sweeter he is. <laughs> but the point is, we know that's an illusion, that there's a three-dimensional person in there when we look in the mirror. Or even if we look in a rearview mirror and see, let's see a scene behind us in a car, we know that it's behind us. It's not, it's not through a window. We know that. And we don't have to think about it. So we see it as if it were there, and we interact with it when it's somewhere else. So we have, we have that cognitive dissonance is completely encompassed in that one cognition. Because we don't have to repeat the, the, the experience of reaching at the mirror and bumping into the surface and realizing it's just a reflection. Because we've had that experience. So it's something like that, this thing about the three perceptual habits of thereness and not thereness and then not qualifying. You know, when you see something in peripheral vision or something, an example of the not qualifying, you know, if I, I'm looking at you and I kind of am aware of the pillar out there or somewhere, but I don't kind of like it, get focused on it. It's just, it's, uh, it's, not, it's in my perception, but it's not noticed and therefore it's not qualified as being really there or not there. That's an example of that. So I'm, I'm launching right into, because we're doing Heart Sutra, right? So Heart Sutra just means that if you just remember from the very beginning that emptiness means infinite relativity, is actually what it means. It's the discovery of relativity. It's not the discovery of a kind of deeper nothingness. It's infinite relativity. Then, you know, you will not be frightened if you have a if you, get, if you have an experience of empty, some kind of feeling of everything disappearing, <clears throat> and you will, you will maybe a little bit draw strength from the infinity of the universe, that you know, anything is possible. You know. and the, good, the positive ending, happy ending to history could be the case. You know, best of all possible worlds could be, even in spite of Mr. Voltaire, dear old Voltaire in his garden, best of all possible worlds could be the case. And therefore, we could have an ideal opportunity of life here in the kind of human being that we are to fully understand the nature of things. We really could. It's possible. We don't think so. We feel very frustrated with a lot of things we don't know. You know we're like the way we are. But it's possible we could come to be free. And we also think we're resigned to thinking that, that we're going to suffer and things are going to go wrong. Everybody's like half miserable. And I even, you know, people laugh when I say, but it's true. We're conditioned to think when we do for temporarily don't feel miserable, we feel really worried. <laughs> so when we feel a little bit happy and we're sort of, yeah, but really I'm miserable. When that feels, just makes us feel secure about being happy. <laughs> that it's only being reflected in the ongoing stream of our misery. So then we feel safe. We are kind of temporarily jolly, but we kind of don't notice. And we say, no, I'm really miserable. You know? It's not really good enough. Right? You look doubtful. <laughs> but you smile. I'm, I'm talking to my friend there. OK. I mean, you're all my friends, but that particularly, she knows what I'm talking about. OK. So <clears throat> that's the Heart Sutra. It's not, emptiness is not nothingness. And even there are people who go saying, I realized emptiness. And in a way you can say that, but um, in a way if you perceive, if you have an experience of empty space or something, that's not emptiness. Knocking on this tabletop is emptiness, just as much as an experience of empty space. Really, and actually it's almost, Knocking on the table is a more challenging experience of emptiness, you know. Emptiness is a straight, 
what they call an exclusion negation, an absolute negation. And so in a way, what emptiness means, where, how do you understand emptiness? When you're looking at the nature of things, and, you, and then you really look deeply and you drill down, as, as Bill Gates likes to say, used to like to say when he was running Microsoft, you drill down into a problem, you, know, you really focus deeply on the, looking into the nature of something. And then the thing in that, in, that, in that meditative thought experiment, that contemplative thought experiment, you actually don't see the thing anymore. And even you don't see yourself not seeing it or seeing it. And even then you will have an experience as if you will kind of be consciously unconscious. That will be a very deep experience. You'll encounter nothingness. But then your realization of emptiness is you know that the nothingness is nothing. It's the emptiness of nothing. The emptiness of nothingness. So you realize that nothingness is not an object. It's not a place you are. And that is your realization of emptiness when you drill through the nothingness and your sense of disappearing disappears and you're here. And then where you are is a different place because you're in an infinite relativity. So everything is possible. Do you follow? It's, it's not difficult, is it? It's not rocket science. It's okay. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special tours with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us. Trips in 2019 include Sri Lanka.